Okay. We'll do problem solving on quant chapter one. <clears throat> We're going to take problems from curriculum. And uh, these are the examples <clears throat> in curriculum, okay? Uh, or the CF Institute book. So the uh, first chapter is rates and returns, right? And the very first example here that deals with, um, they are giving you information for five debt securities, right? So debt is fixed income securities. So basically bonds. Uh, and they all of them prom promise only a single payment at maturity. So basically these are zero coupon bonds or discount bonds, or uh, you pay one time and then you receive, uh, like you pay the money now, right? And then you get the uh, your principal, what you pay in the beginning plus the interest in the end hmm? assume that premiums relating to inflation liquidity and default risk are constant across all time horizons hmm? so whether you are investing for say two year maturity or seven year maturity or eight year maturity um the amount of uh, you know uh, premium liquidity premium or default premium that you will be adding is the same hmm. so that's uh, assumption so that our life uh, is simple okay based on the information address the following explain the difference between the interest rate offered by investment one and investment two so investment one and investment two hmm. so this is debt security one debt security two both of them have two year maturity right and uh, both of them have low default risk hmm. so say they are offered by um, i don't know uh, some safe corporation or something like that however one of the bonds um, has a lot of liquidity means it's easy to trade in and out of it hmm. um, it's like i purchase it today and within an hour if i want to sell it i uh, th there is enough trading going on and i can i'll be able to liquidate my investment similarly it's easier to buy also hmm. however this one it has low liquidity there's not much trading going on in this bond the volume are not that high right so uh, why so so do you see that the first one first investment um which is exactly the same as second except that it has high liquidity uh, this one offers only two percent interest rate Right, and the other one offers 2.5. Why does it offer higher? Because it this one which has low liquidity, there is more risk in it because of liquidity issues. I will may not be able to sell it at the price that I want to sell it, or <clears throat> and therefore we are adding 0.5 percent liquidity premium um, just to account for the fact that this one has low liquidity. Apart from that, they are exactly the same. Right, so that's that's the difference uh, between one and two. Ex estimate the default risk premium affecting all securities. So, what we will do is, in order to um, uh, look at the default risk premium, uh, just like how we looked at liquidity, we looked at two investments that are that were similar, except they had different liquidities. So similarly, now look for two investments that have maturity same and, and uh, um, you know liquidity same and default risk uh, is different. Uh, do we see anything like that? I don't see uh, because eight years maturity, eight years maturity, uh, high liquidity, low liquidity, two and two. And so, but at least over here, um, you know, if I go with these four and five to figure out default um, risk premium, uh, I would have loved for these to be either both low liquidity or both high liquidity, right? So that the only thing that was different was default risk. But here they are different with respect to liquidity also. However, we need not worry. Why? Because we already know the liquidity premium right so i can 
make this one, which is low liquidity, a high liquidity by subtracting the liquidity premium. How about that? So in, then they will either become both low liquidity or both high, high liquidity, right? If it's high liquidity, and if I want to make it low liquidity, I can just add liquidity premium to it. Hmm. And we already calculated liquidity premium as uh, 0.5. So, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so what I can do is, let's say I want to make this high liquidity as low liquidity. Then I add 0.5 to it, right? So now if I add 0.5, this number becomes 4.5. Right, so this is now low liquidity, low liquidity, and 4.5, 6.5. So, because this has high default risk, there is even though they are everything is the same, right? So, after um, the changes, <coughs> excuse me, this becomes 4.5, this becomes 6.5. So, the default risk premium should be 2. Two percent must be the default risk premium. So adjust for the liquidity premium and <clears throat> forward. Calculate the upper and lower limits for the unknown interest rate for investment three R three. So upper and lower limits. So there is this investment three. We don't know the interest rate offered by this right or the yield or the returns offered by this right so we need to figure this out again this is uh, we will have to use the reasoning uh, to get this uh, and they are not asking for exact interest rate they are asking for uh, limits which means the lower and the upper bound <clears throat> so uh, this is a seven year maturity instrument so it is lying between two and eight year maturity, right? If it's lying between two and eight year maturity, it it's lower and inter, lower and upper limit should be at least two and a half and four. I mean, that's a gross way of looking at it. I mean, it cannot be now. Uh, <clears throat> this one. So do you see this seven year maturity <clears throat> is the same as two year maturity in terms of default in terms of liquidity risk and default risk right so and if you look at the eight year maturity it has the low default risk but it has high liquidity right so can you imagine if i need to now figure out if 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 let's say uh, so I know the lower bound will be at least 2.5 because seven year maturity matches the two year maturity in liquidity and default risk. Hmm. Upper bound, uh, if I need to figure out, then I also need to make the high liquidity for eight year equal to low liquidity and then calculate the interest rate. Right. So if I make this low liquidity, right. And I know that the liquidity premium is 0.5, then the upper bound should be at least 4.5. Then I'll be comparing again apples to apples. Right. So the upper, the lower and the upper bound should be two and a half and uh, four and a half percent. Yeah, two and a half and four and a half percent. So look for common things and then what is not common, make it common by adding or subtracting. A premium that's the general theme that you are working with in these problems ah, then you get to holding period returns right so holding period returns remember they are unannualized hmm? so there is uh, which means basically they don't take care take into account how long it took for you to generate that return so someone purchased 100 shares for 34.5 at the beginning of the quarter. Then they all sold all 100 shares for 30.5 per share after receiving 51.55 dividend at the end of the quarter. So first, uh, first of Jan they purchased and then 31st March they sold and first of Jan price was 
and 31st March price was 30.5, right? And so what is their capital gain? Their capital gain is, uh, it's a loss in this case, right? 30.5 minus 34.5, right? However, they also received a huge dividend, 51 point, uh, uh, 55, wow. That's a huge, oh, that's a, oh, that's a total dividend on 100 shares. Okay, so that's that's something to keep in mind. So when you're working with these problems, either work with per unit shares. So the 51.55 dividend will become 0.5155 per share. Uh, or you say that I paid 3,450 and received 3,050 after selling it. And I also received 51.55 dividend. And then calculate your HPR. And HPR will be nothing but the difference in the ending price minus the beginning price plus the income that you have received divided by the initial investment of 3450 and again we we are not including any kind of commissions and uh, things of that nature here hmm? so uh, you can break this down into two components one component is called as the capital gains or in this case it's a capital loss uh, of this much divided by 3450, which is negative 11.6%. 11 11 and you can, the other component is the dividend yield, which is 51.55 divided by 3450, 3, which is a dividend yield of 1.49%. So dividend received over the investment made. That's dividend yield. Capital gain or loss made over the initial investment, that is capital gain or loss as a percentage and the total of these two 1.49 percent plus minus 11.59 percent is negative 10.1 percent so you can also break it down between capital gains and income okay moving on so then analyst obtains the following annual rates of return for a mutual fund so in 2008, this mutual fund returned 14%, 2009 minus 10, 2010 minus 2%. What is the fund's holding period return over the three year period? So remember, you will have to, this is multiplicative. Do not start adding up numbers, right? So first year, if you had invested $1, that $1 grew by 14%. So that $1 became 1 plus 0.14 or 1.14 hmm? then this 1.14 lost 10 percent so you will now say this gets multiplied by 1 minus 0.1 which is 10 percent loss right which basically means 90 percent of 1.14 now at the end of two years this is the value of your investment right now the next year happened right and then you again lost minus two so that means only 98 percent of this value will remain at the end of third year so which is nothing but one minus 0 0.02 so be careful two is two percent is 0 0.02 10 percent is 0 0.1 14 percent is 0 0.14 right and so ultimately this is your one dollar grows to this much at the end of three years this is ending value Right. And if you need to calculate what is the percentage, the percentage is the change from ending value to beginning value divided by one. And you don't have to do divide by one because anything divided by one still remains the same. Um, you do this calculation and you get 0 0.0055. This is in decimals. If you need to convert decimals to percentages, multiply it by 100. So the answer is 0.55%. <clears throat> Okay, then geometric mean return. Again, there is another fund, um, you know, that's returning 22 minus 25, then 11. And what is their geometric mean return? So, how does geometric mean return, geometric mean or CAGR or TWR, how is it different from HPR? They are annualized, right? Here, <clears throat> how is here, what you will do is, you will again link the returns, right? $1 becomes 1.22, right? 
right? Then 1.22 lost 25%. So the ending number by the end of year two is only 75% of 1.22. So minus 25% loss is subtract 0.25 from one. Then at the end of the two years, this is the number, then this number grows at 11% and it becomes the second year number is multiplied by 1.11, right? So far, so good. And then do not take, forget to take the square root, uh, uh, the roots, right? Which is raised to the power for however long you held that investment. If you held that investment for three years, which is beginning of 2008 to end of 2008 is one year, beginning of 2009 to end of 2009 is two years, beginning of 2010 to end of 2000. Uh, 10 is three years. So you got three years returns. You need to annualize it by taking it to the power of one by three, right? So whatever the number, right here. So how will you do is you you will basically uh, do one point two two multiplied by you know. Uh, or if you want to do this in one go, by the way, in your calculator, right? You can use the uh, bracket open function, right? So suppose you uh, suppose you minus one minus point two five, simple for most of us to do uh, multiply by uh, you know point uh, seven five. But if if you got to one point two two multiplied by bracket open one minus 0 0.25 bracket close then i get 2.9150 then i again multiply this with 1.11 that comes to 1.0157 now i need to take its cube root or i need to raise it to the power of 1 by 3 right so what i can do is if I don't know, uh, you know how to do. What I will do is I'll store it in zero, right? I'll this number I'll say STO zero, right? Then I need to calculate what is one by three, right? So one by three, I'll just say three, and then I'll take its reciprocal. I'll hit the one by x number here, so I get point three three. I will store it in digit one. Okay. Then what I will do is I will recall the zero, which is 1.0157. And I'll use this function y to the power x. I'll hit y to the power x. Then I will hit recall one. And then I'll say equal to, I get 1.0052, right? Once I get 1.0052, I subtract one from it. So I get 0 0.0052. 0 0.0052 in percentage terms is 0.52 percent. Right? That's essentially how. And practice a lot of problems like this so that you become fast in inputting numbers. Okay. Then we move on to geometric and arithmetic mean returns. Right. So annual returns for years one to three for selected countries, stock indices, right? Um, which is exactly my investment advice. Uh, you pass your exams and great, or if you get a job, great, uh, you know, and if you get a job as an analyst under a portfolio manager, best. But if not, uh, then you probably would know what to do in seven to 10 years otherwise. Invest in ETFs or index funds of whatever country you happen to live in. If you live in Australia, just look for Australian index ETF fund. If you live in US, look for US index ETF. If you live in India, look for um, Indian ETF like say Nifty Bs or you know uh, ICICI Nifty ETF or something like that. So anyway, this country A has these kind of yearly returns. And they are calculating uh, three year return arithmetic, which is nothing but sum these up, divide by three. 
and geometric, which is nothing but exactly what, what we did. The way we will do it is like here, right? Convert these into decimals because this is a percentage. Minus 15.6 would be minus 0.156. Minus 5.4 would be minus a 0 0.054. So you have to learn to work with negative numbers, small numbers, divide them by 100, <coughs> things of that nature. OK, then you keep multiplying them. Then uh, zero. So anyway, let me con con complete this thought. Then multiply by 1.061. Then whatever the final number, raised to the power 1 by 3, just how I did it. You know, That's how you'll get this. So here they are asking you, uh, calculate the arithmetic and geometric mean return for countries D, E, and F. So that's basically it. I mean, they've already given it, given you the numbers, average three-year returns. But figure out and do it yourself. Again, don't just look at it. Learn to pick up your calculator, punch the numbers. Um, learn to do things yourself. Unless you do it yourself, you will never learn, learn what exactly happened. So like how they're doing it. They're showing you the returns. Sum up, divide by three. You should get this. And then convert these into decimals because these are percentages. And then start adding one to each of them and then multiply those numbers. Then take raise to the power one by three. This is exactly what they're doing over here. One minus 0 0.024 is 0 0.976. One minus 0 0.031 is 0 0.969. 1 plus 0 0.062 is 1.062. Multiply the three. You get this as the product. After you get this, the product, take it to the power 1 by 3. You get this. From this, take out 1 and then multiply by 100. You get 0.146. Remember this 0.146%. This, this, the, the decimal number is 0 0.00146. So be very careful when you do these things and uh, uh, to be very cautious so that when you're working with decimals and uh, percentages. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying this. Uh, my advice is just to show you so that you do not get overwhelmed just by like, looking at these problems and end up spending two hours. My, my job is to get you started and have hand hold your hand so that you will pick up your calculators and do it and not waste 20 30 minutes just reading the problem but i you know i'm not picking up the calculator and punching the numbers that would be major spoon feeding right so please solve these problems on your own and if you are not feeling confident solve the same problem twice hmm? and at least you know one thing but you know it really well Okay, then we get to harmonic mean and cost averaging. So cost averaging, that's just like we discussed in the class, um, right? That's basically your SIP, systematic investment plan. And somebody is investing 1,000 euros each month in a particular stock for two months. So in total, they have invested, what, 2,000 rupees, right? The First time they made the investment, the first month the price was 10. Second time they made the investment, the price had gone up to 15. Right? What's the average price paid for the security? Right? So there are two ways you can do this. Right? You can either um, basically uh, figure out the total amount spent. Right? The total amount spent is 2,000. Right? 2,000 euros. Okay. Then now remember, I want to figure out average price per share, right? So uh, I already know the total amount is 2000. So that's the numerator, which is the price, you know. And then I need to figure out per share. So how many shares I have purchased with these $2,000 euros? I will uh, say with 1000 euros the first month, I'll be at 10, uh, 10 euro per share, I'll be able to purchase 100 shares, correct? Now, at 1,000 euros, with 15 euro shares, I'll be able to purchase 66.67 shares. So in total, with 2,000 shares, I have purchased 166.67.
right so therefore per share i must have paid 2000 divided by 166.67 equal to 12 euros right per share right that's one way of doing it the other way of doing it is harmonic mean like we had discussed in the class how many observations are there there are two observations right and what's the price that you paid per share 10 and 15 so what do you do you take the reciprocal you take reciprocal of 10 which is 10 and 1 by x plus you take the reciprocal of 15 so i get um, 0.1667 okay. now this itself um, <clears throat> is in the denominator so i have to take its reciprocal and then i multiply it by 2 so i get 12 right so the formula itself is 2 divided by 1 by 10 plus 1 by 15 1 by 10 is 0 0.1 1 by 15 whatever 0 0.16 no, less, less than that uh, 0 0.06 so 0 0.16 then i take its reciprocal and then multiply it by 2 right uh, always watch the class lectures also go to that specific point you know fast forward to that recording uh, where we had discussed this particular topic see how i had done it um, in the class and uh, solve that particular problem first and then uh, again come back to this solve this multiple times uh, if one by x or reciprocal of a reciprocal and things of that nature um are new to you or the first time it's okay do it by 10 times uh, it becomes second nature okay and then they are trying to give us uh, this idea about you know arithmetic geometric and harmonic mean for p ratio right um <clears throat> so so various stocks are there and at a given point of time um, <clears throat> actually this is p forward p this is uh, ratio of share price to projected earnings per share so this is not last 12 month earnings so when we do financial analysis techniques you will understand the difference between trailing p and forward p right now it's immaterial but he's working when he says e here they they are not saying last 12 month earnings they are saying forward 12 month earnings projected earnings that's okay for their top 10 stock picks such as the p e ratio for these 10 stocks calculate the arithmetic mean so again take out your calculator input these numbers sum them up divide by 10 don't just look at this and say i'll be able to do it no you'll not be able to do it uh, because you need practice to be able to input numbers in your calculator. And uh, it won't come just because you think you know it. Many mistakes will happen because you will input wrong numbers. Uh, your concentration will not be great enough. Instead of inputting 10 numbers, you will input 9 numbers. Instead of inputting 10.72, you will input 1.72. All kinds of things happen. Uh, you will have to go through it and uh, you will have to learn by mistakes unfortunately okay and better make the mistakes now and learn rather than you know in the exam so calculate the geometric mean p for these 10 stocks so again geometric mean you just multiply the numbers right this this keep in mind this is not percentage right these are not rates or returns these are actual numbers so that's okay you just mul keep multiplying them um, and uh, in fact if you think about it even uh, with rates we actually convert them to dollars isn't it when we say one dollar got uh, invested generated 15 percent return it actually became 1.15 which is what we add one times one plus 0.15 so that's exactly what's happening here anyways so geometric mean keep on multiplying do it then once you get that final number then raise it to the power 1 by 10 
which is so you can do whatever the final number after multiplication hit y y to the power x hit 0.1 and that is your geometric way in this case because you're not calculating any percentage no need to subtract one or anything like that right you're not calculating any retreat or returns that's the geometric mean there's another formula uh, you can do it like this also but uh, it's just too complicated you know so you can just leave this direct multiplication and after that taking it to the power to, to the root power of however many however many observations that's good enough now calculate the harmonic mean same thing right for each of these observations start taking their reciprocals right so 22.29 1 by x plus 15.54 1 by x plus 9.38 1 by x some 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 10 sums of reciprocals and then that sum of the reciprocal itself hit 1 by x after that and then multiply it by 10 and so you will get harmonic mean Then similar problems, uh, they've given you returns. They want you to calculate arithmetic mean. I believe you can do it. They want you to calculate geometric mean. It should be easy enough. So then comes money weighted and time weighted return. Hmm. So now, so there is some person, they are planning for retirement. I hope they just don't keep planning. They retire at some point. And want to compare the past performance of a few mutual funds that are considering that they are considering for investment. They believe that a comparison over a five-year period would be appropriate. Okay. They gather information on a fund they are considering. The name is Ryan Valley Superior Fund. Germans. Um, now this fund has assets under management at the beginning of the year is 30. Then they generated 15% returns that became 45 million, then 45 million lost certain amount. Then it became 20 million, but it's not just uh, probably some withdrawal also, right? And then 20 million generated certain returns and then 25 million and all that. By the way, um, these assets under management, you know, um that's the amount that the portfolio manager is working with hmm? in our business these millions and all are just uh, chump change okay uh, unless these guys are playing in billions this this business does not become very profitable so it's uh, economies of scale are very much play in this business just like many other businesses because this guy only gets a the portfolio manager only gets a percentage of uh, the number um, and so anyway so there is uh, they are showing you how this fund uh, you know when it started at the beginning it was zero and then they added 30 million you know so the investors put in 30 million dollars and no one withdrew the first month and no no withdrawal and so um so balance was 30 then they generated 15 percent on this so 15 percent of 30 is 4.5 so 30 plus 4.5 became 34.5 this is the number that they started with in the second year and then new money came in because you know the, uh, the fame spreads and um, the world must have gotten out that they guy these guys did good job uh, so so you know new money came in so now in the beginning of the year so in the beginning of the year when the new money came in he's not playing with 34.5 he's now playing with 34.5 plus 0.5 35 plus 10 45 right and then um, he lost money he lost so <clears throat> when he lost um, you know 
um, he lost 5% on 45, so he lost 2.25, right? So balance at the end of the year was 42.75. Now, 42.75, investors don't like losses, and the bad word has now gotten out, and so people are withdrawing. There's an exit and uh, of the investors. So people have withdrawn 22.75. So you see now this year is only going to play with 20. Those of you who want to become a portfolio manager and whatnot, keep in mind this is a very real story. You know, and this this comes with a lot of pain. The same investors who wanted to give you money are now rushing out, exit. You know, so anyway, <clears throat> 20, and then this generated 10% return on 20, which is Two, and so therefore the ending value of the investment is or the fund is 22. Same thing, 22 starts. Now, some new because he generated 10%, some new money has come in. Um, thankfully, it's still not making up for the big money that went out, isn't it? So he now plays with 25, did a good job, 15% returns, and 15% of 25 is 3.75, it becomes 28.75. Uh, then again, some more new money has come in, and net balance is 35, and so on and so forth. Now, calculates the fund's holding period return for the five year, right? So, holding period return again, unanalyzed. You already know the numbers 15% minus 5%, 10%. Just keep adding one to decimals, multiply them. No need to analyze because this is holding period return. Don't forget to subtract one from the overall number. So on for on a five year basis, one uh, uh, you know so, uh, people if you put in one dollar, it became one point four two dollars, right? If you put in hundred, it became one hundred and forty two. Decent, not bad. Okay, compute the funds arithmetic mean and will return, right? So uh, arithmetic again, just add up all these percentages. And then divide by the number of observations, you get 7.6 as the arithmetic mean. Now, compute geometric mean. So, work with percentages, right? Same like this. So, in the exam, it will be nice if for the same fund they are asking HPR as well as CAGR because. Or, or uh, <clears throat> GM, gender geometric mean, same thing, right? CAGR geometric mean, because you will all would you already would have computed this this number, right? All you have to do is then raise it to the power of one by five, or raise it to the power of 0. 0.2, and once you get that, subtract one from it, and you get 7.32. So the geometric mean is smaller than the arithmetic mean. Okay. And then, and why? Because we discussed it, right? Because it's the effect of compounding where um, you need a smaller number to compound with uh, to get to the same ending number. Okay, they want to earn a minimum annual return of 5%. Okay, the annual returns and investment amounts are presented in exhibit 13. This, let me post this. This this exhibit 13. This is where it was presented. The now is the money weighted annual return greater than 5%, right? So basically, what they want you to calculate is they want you to calculate money weighted return. Now, for money weighted return, as we had seen in the class at this point, go to the lecture class lecture. If you did not understand money weighted return, Go to the point where we did money weighted return. Go to the spreadsheet where we did money weighted return. See how we were looking for net changes in investments, right? And so, uh, what we are saying is for this fund, right? They started with 30. So, 30 has gone out. So, CF0 input 30. CF1, you see, now 10.5 is the net change. <clears throat> <clears throat> Again, new 10.5 has been added. When it has been added, please keep in mind it is subtraction. 30 is a subtraction. <clears throat> the fund is not generating 30 and 10.5. You are giving money to the fund, right? 
So minus 30, minus 10.5, and then withdrawal, right? So now when the, the this is from the perspective of the investor, right? So first I gave them 30, minus 30, then I gave them minus 10.5, then I withdrew 22.75 from the entire thing, right? Okay, then. <clears throat> Then again, I gave them three. Right. And by the way, it lot here in our example, the way we did MWR, there was a, all, there was sometimes then addition and subtraction both. We were so net will always be right minus 30 plus zero minus 10.5 plus zero minus zero. Um, plus minus 22.75 plus 22.75 or minus of minus however you want to do this uh, anyway and then you again put in 6.25 so long story short um, ah and now this is the thing okay in the end you do have to put in the um, the ending value of the investment Okay, so the, the, because you do want to know what happened after all this and the, the, this this is so the ending value of the investment does not you don't enter it in the middle in, in the middle you only enter the changes, but you have to at any given point of time you have whenever you're calculating MWR you have to give the <clears throat> the ending value of the investment. Hmm. So. And please keep in mind this, these are beginning numbers. Hmm? So this is beginning, this is CF0, this is CF1, this is CF2, this is CF3, this is CF4. And at the end of fifth year, right, it's 36.05. <clears throat> yeah. And, and we are imagining that you're withdrawing the entire 36.05. So if that had been the case, when you had given, taken out, given, taken out, something like that, uh, what has been your returns, right? And this, by the way, is what I want you to do for your own investments when you're doing these day tradings or your uh, strategies or whatever. Keep, you know, on the entire amount that you have invested. How much? You put new money, how much you withdrew, and at any given point of time when you want to calculate, look at the ending value in your DMAT account and put that number in as the last number. And, and therefore, the very first thing you need to learn in investments is how to calculate returns. If you cannot even calculate returns, you are just shooting in the dark uh, with no sight, no target, no nothing, no knowing whether you did good, bad, or ugly. Hmm. So, <clears throat> so anyway, so if you input the numbers and just like how we had um, in the class we had learned, you would hit um, IRR and then you will hit the CPT. If you do that, you will get IRR of 5.86%. So definitely this fund generated more than 5%. So input these numbers and hit IRR. And then uh, once you hit IRR, hit CPT, and uh, you should be good to go. Cool. Time weighted return, right? That's just another name for geometric mean, except that it is used in the context of funds and, uh, <clears throat> and you know, uh, when investments are made, but concept remains the same. Right. And how do we do TWR? We calculate holding period returns for each period. We will calculate holding period return for time period one, for time period two, time period three. And then we will link those returns. And then we will take, if this is four, four year returns, then we'll raise it to the power one by four. Right. So this, I think you can do it on your own. So for each period, they are calculating returns, right? 
P1 minus P0 by P0. <coughs> so this is 0.2. Uh, keep in mind, this is 20%, okay? 5 million has become 6 million. Hmm? Okay. But from decimal point of view, it is 1.2, right? So they are linking these things. Linking, 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 linking. <coughs> And keep in mind, uh, I made a mistake here, which is good. I am glad I made that mistake. I said raised to the power one by four, right? It's not happening. Why? Because these are quarterly returns. These are four quarters. These are not four years, <clears throat> which is the mistake that I made. You see, and these little, little things can throw you off and get you the wrong number. These are quarters. So I'm linking the first quarter with the second to third to fourth, and then I make the whole year. But um, if this was years if, instead of quarters, then I would have raised it to the power one by four. So this is why in this example, they are not annualizing it because four quarters make an, an uh, make an annual return anyways, right? So don't make the mistake that I made, read things properly. And then this, the, this is the, <clears throat> they're basically making you do it for two funds. So this account, and then there is this account. So practice input numbers to go crazy. Have fun. Okay. Then there is time weighted and money weighted rate of return side by side, exactly like what we did in the class. Like we looked at the same thing from two uh, for the same investment. We calculated TWR as well as MWR. Um, so there is a certain market value uh, of this fund, right? On first Jan, then during the period first to thirtieth April, so four months, they generated a gain of ten million on an investment of hundred million. So this is a running total. Everything you have to keep in mind. What's going on? On first May, the some two million dividend got paid. So basically, at the end of thirtieth April. All dividends were reinvested in additional shares. Because the fund's performance had been exceptional, whoa, institutions invested an additional 20 million. Whoa. Welcome. Uh, raising assets under managed to management to 132 million. So check this out. So you started with 100, right? Then you <clears throat> got a gain of 10%, 10 million, right? Plus you gain, uh, plus you had two dollars of dividend. Plus new money came in, right? So the ending value of the investment, um, as of 30th April or 1st May, whatever you want to call it, is 132. Hmm? On 31st December, they received. So now we have moved from April. We have traveled through May, June, September, October, November, and we now directly come to 31st December. They receive total dividends of 2.64 million again, right? Uh, and the fund's market value was um, 140. So with the dividends, actually, it will become 2.64 because they are saying market value not including the dividends was 140. So the total market value would be 140 plus 2.64. The fund made no other interim cash payments during the year. Fine. Okay. Compute their time weighted uh, rate of return. So, for time weighted rate of return, you have to calculate uh, numbers uh, by period. Hmm? And um, this is it's a good problem because now there are two periods here. If you look at this question carefully, this there is a period from 1st to 30th April, and there's a period from 1st May to 31st December. Hmm. So first to 30th April is four months, and then April to December, uh, you know, will be uh, eight months. So do you see they are not equal time periods? Um, so that's something to keep in mind. However, uh, again, uh, the thing is, um, you do not need to worry because four months plus eight months do make it 12 months. So no need to worry about annualizing this, that, and the other. 
the earlier example we had four months three months three months three months four periods here you have only two periods and they are unequal but that's okay it's not because their total in make it 12 months so uh, the concept of working with annualizations and all that uh, that you don't have to worry and they don't make your life that difficult so so then so you start with 100 million right so now calculate hpr for two periods one is first jan to 30th april and then second is first may to 31st december so you start with 100 million right and then you the, the ending portfolio value was 110 million right um <clears throat> So 100, what was that? 100, so you got 10 million and then you also got 2 million, perfect. So this, the change, the net change, right? You can either say 100 million has become 110 plus 2, 112, or you can say, so, or you, so you can do 112 minus 100 by 100, or you can say the net change is either 112 minus, uh, 100 which is 12 or you can say the net change is 10 plus 2 which is also 12 right so p1 minus p0 plus the dividend is basically 10 plus 2 you started with 100 million so the first four months you generated 12 percent return be very careful here please do not include 20 million of investment in your uh, performance right that that has got nothing otherwise you would be saying that the fund has now become uh, 110 plus 212 plus 20 which is 132 million it might be looking like that but actually 100 million only became 112 that 20 was a new cash so do not get confused with the new cash new cash has not done any work till now so the returns will be calculated on 100 million only now, for the next year, you uh, for the next period, you will start with 132 million. Perfect. And then we will see what happened to 132 million. So from 1st May to end, 1st May, you started with 132 million. They got a dividend, I think. Uh, <clears throat> so 132 million is what they started with. And then they got 2.64 in dividends. And... Uh, 140 was the change in market value uh, market value changed to 140 so the change was 140 minus 132 8 million plus 2.64 million on an investment of 132 you got 8.06 so the first four months you got 12 percent the next eight months you got 8.06 percent and now what you're going to do is you're going to link them so 1.12 times 1.0806 minus 1 21.03 right no need to analyze or anything because 8 plus 4 in makes it a 12 month period hmm? okay next one what's their money weighted rate of return perfect right so money weighted rate of return you have to work with changes and in the end you need to add the ending market value so first thing first what was the amount invested initially initially you put in 100 million isn't it yep 100 million okay then <clears throat> we fly through the time and then the next time period that we are looking at this thing is the end of april right end of april they are saying minus 20. why minus 20. so that and that's the <clears throat> remember mwr is working with changes hmm. why because 20 new uh, 20 came in um, so remember first you put in 100 minus 100 then you put in minus 20 hmm. okay now then what happened <clears throat> Then, <clears throat> so 
CF0 was the beginning of uh, Jan 1st, uh, then April end, fine. And then CF2. Yeah. Mm, cash outflows. CF2, what is this CF2? Mm, second four month interval had no cash flow. Oh, so they have, they are making it. Yes, make sure. Correct. Perfect. Good. Uh, yeah. We need uh, for the MV, MWR formula, um, we need to break it into uh, equal um, periods. So, good job otherwise it that formula would uh, not work so the period is from so one one more thing to keep in mind so from first jan to april 30th or first may whatever you want to call it and then april full month of april full month of may full month of uh, june and full month of july so july June and July are what 31? Um, July, August are 31. Then um, three, four months period, right? So then August, September, October, no, no, what did I? Four months till April. Oh, April 30 is already here. Sorry, this is my bad. So this is up till April 30th, isn't it? So now May, June, July, August. So August 31st. So this is another four months. Then September, October, November, December. This is another four months till December 31st. This is how they're doing it for MWR formula. These time periods need to be equal. Hmm. Anyway, so now just add up the changes. So basically what they're saying is, um, for this, the CF2, right, which is basically the, uh, the, the period um, <clears throat> from August, from April to August, basically, there was nothing that was happening. And then at the end of that, and, and the end of um, December, which is September, October, November, December, four months, the market value was 142.64 and this by the way this 142.64 just be uh, careful this already includes this dividend and this also includes this dividend so therefore you you don't want to add it somewhere in the middle because that's including everything in uh, you know so don't add the 2.64 or anything like that you know uh, you you only want to look at the changes and the final value the final value will include uh, all the and the changes in money addition or subtraction not even the changes in the market value be very careful okay so that being said just input these numbers and go for the glory <clears throat> use the irr function interpret the differences between funds time weighted and money weighted rates of return correct so again they, they also want you to know why uh, with same thing we discussed this in the class also irr comes to 6.28 percent and twr comes to um, whoa 21.03 that six is the uh, six is the quarterly uh, six is the four month number you have to annualize it right so there are going to be three periods in uh, three four month period in a year right so this is a four month return so this is the periodic rate so one plus periodic rate raised to the power mn n is one right uh, m is three so this is what they're doing 1.0628 raised to the power 3 minus 1 or 20 percent so mwr comes to 20.05 percent and twr comes to 
21.03%. So why is TWR higher than MWR, right? And the answer for that is essentially, um, basically for the first four month period, okay, the return was 12%. And for the next eight month period, the return was 8%. So you can see that when they were working with lesser money, they generated higher returns, right? But when they were working with more money, with 132 million, they generated less return. And that too, 8% on over eight over eight months. This 12% was over only four months, right? So MWR is going to be less because more money was employed at a time when the returns were lower. And MWR gives emphasis to that. So uh, therefore. MWR is adjusting or lowering your returns to account for the fact that more money generated lower returns for that eight month period. And uh, that essentially is the difference between returns computed in MWR and TWR. So a few things we learned here, right? First is make equal time periods for MWR, right? And uh, the second, mm, the, the return that was computed was for that particular quarter. Or quarter because not, this was not quarter. This was four-month period. You have to analyze it. So uh, quite a intensive computational thing. So, analyzing the returns, non-annual compounding. So this. Um, present values and things of that nature. The manager of a Canadian pension fund knows that the fund must make a lump sum payment of CAD 5 million 10 years from today. Right. So they must make CAD 5 million. So they have to pay 5 million 10 years from today. So N is 10, right? She wants to invest an amount today in a guaranteed investment contract. So think of this like a fixed deposit or something like that. So that it will grow to the required amount. The current interest rate is 6% a year compounded monthly. So which is, if you do not read this carefully, you will miss this compounded monthly part. And the answers will be wrong. So, so. When it is compounded monthly, then you have 10 periods in each year, right? And there are 10 years. So there will be 12 periods in each year, and there are 10 years. So you will end up with 120 periods. And that 6% essentially needs to be divided by 12, because that is the M, right? So that becomes 0.5%, right? And now this, and, and so, What's the question is how much she should invest today? So that's basically they're asking you to calculate the present value, right? So you already know N, you know I by Y is 0.5, right? Uh, don't add 0.5%, just add 0.5, right? You already know future value is minus 5. What should be the P? Compute P. And those of you who are working with uh, BA2 plus regular, put zero in PMT as well. And so that uh, your computer calculator does not malfunction. If it is calculating without inputting the PMT zero, that's cool. Because by default, PMT should be zero if you're not inputting anything in it. So you don't have to go through this kind of a way of calculating, right? You just use the TVM function in your calculators, like how we learned in the class. And Go the way of happy people. Mm. Analyzing returns. <clears throat> so in hundred days, um, you know. So there is someone is uh, figuring out, uh, you know, uh, relative performance of various investments, right? So hundred days, some security has returned or earned 6.2%. 
right some security has earned 2% in 4 weeks and some security has earned 5% over 3 months right so now which one is better they all have earned different returns over different time periods so what do you need to do you need to all, and you need to analyze them you need to analyze what does that mean it means as if this if this security was instead of 100 days if it was invested for 365 days and if the return was compounding what would their return be right so so roughly you know to think about these things so there are 365 days in a year right and so suppose this was 100 days i'm just trying to give you a rough idea as to how to uh, so approximately there are what about three and a half periods of 100 days in a year 3.65 actually if you go about it so approximately in 100 days it earns 6.2 then in two periods of 100 days in 200 days this would have doubled to 12.4 in three periods of 100 days up to 300 days this would have um, you know add another 6.2 right so about 20 or something and then you are left with some 65 days right which is about one third of 100 and so add a little bit more so at least you will understand what you are doing but this is compounding so the numbers will be a little bit higher and how do we combine com compound we say one plus periodic rate raised to the power mn and in this case we are compounding a smaller time period into a bigger time period of one year so that becomes raised to the power 3.65 which is nothing but 365 by 100 right because this one is getting compounded for 3.65 times right you can think of it like that then two percent over four weeks and how now how many four weeks are there in 52 weeks because in a year there are 52 weeks so how many four weeks are there in 50 to 52 by four so that's what will be the number of number of times this will be compounding in a year right so like in four weeks in let basically that's one month all right approximately so one month it has earned two so in 12 months it should earn around 24 percent right so but because it is annualizing that number will be higher uh, sorry because it is compounding that number will be higher so learn to do these things qualitatively in your head um, before you just directly start inputting punching the numbers so that when you get the answers you can make some sense of it uh, especially when you go to work and all they will ask you to explain like what did you do really um, and all you have learned uh, you know in your education is to compute the numbers and not be able to explain away uh, nobody gives you money for that okay security c has earned five percent over three months so that's one quarter how many quarters are there in a year four so now this should be about 20 percent right if you analyze or if you compound it over a year that will be more than 20 percent 21.5 and then see which one gave you the highest return and then that's the security that generated the highest investment return Similarly, they have some exchange traded fund performance, it's ETFs, which is basically an in, it need not be an index, but yeah. So, and we'll discuss what an ETF is when we get to equity. Okay, uh, again, 146 days, this has generated 4.61. So, so this is about what, 150 days? So there are about approximately what, 150 times two is 300. So there are about approximately two and a little bit more um periods of 146 days something like that right so this number will approximately more than double uh, but if it's compounding it will be a little bit higher so when you get the number if it's 4.6 4.6 plus 4.6 you know some 9.2 or something and because it's compounding and because the number of periods are a little bit more than two uh, your number should be higher than that five weeks again 52 by five 15 months now do not, this is interesting okay so this will be there are 12 months in a year this guy sucked he uh, uh, no actually i shouldn't say sucked 
they th this guy made 14 percent in 15 months so one and three three um, one year and three months right and and three months is one point uh, is point two five of a year because there are four periods of three months point two five point two five point two five and so ultimately over here like how you had to do you had to do more for 146 days for 15 months you have to do less because you have to bring it back to 12 months right so this number will be 15 by 12. no sorry uh, I, I, I did the uh, 12 by 15 my bad 12 by 15 right so the compounding you have to bring it back because he has gone beyond one year so you need to now penalize this guy and say Ki, how much he has done this much in 15 months but i want to see how much he would have done in 15, 12 months right so here this guy has generated 4.61 in 146 days i want to see how he would have done in 365 days so so just be careful whenever the number whenever the time period goes above one the raise to the power will become less than one 12 by 15 is less than one So you see, even though he generated 14%, but after annualizing, that became some 11%. So in this case, ETF2 has done better. Um, <clears throat> now we get to uh, this example A they're talking about. So that family that was doing some retirement planning. Uh, he was not being fair to the fund manager by including the asset management fee and other expenses because the small size of the fund would put it at competitive disadvantage. That's true. You know what they're trying to say is this guy is only the fund manager is only managing some 30 million or something like that. Right. And I already told you that's not a big amount uh, in the industry because the other expenses are quite high. And because the other expenses are quite high. Um, this uh, this money management business doesn't work if you're playing with smaller numbers because a lot of uh, expenses come in the lawyers fee the auditors fee uh, you know reporting happens people you need people in operations you know, it just creates a lot of uh, work and uh, and then expense ratio is what it is you know you can only charge so much on the fund so what they are saying is for this guy it's uh, you know 30 million and whatnot i mean he's doing a decent job actually if you think about it 15 percent and whatnot now what they are saying is suppose if this 15 percent right we now want to so we want to see his performance okay now the thing that they are making us understand over here is in this fund they spend five hundred thousand every year on expenses that are unrelated to managers performance that's true so like you know all these things that i told you my auditor the maid the electricity bill the this and that all that gets taken out from your uh, uh, funds performance so that so when they say 15 percent return right that 15 percent return has taken out all the ex other expenses you see this guy is working with a lower base and he's supporting 500,000 on a base of 30 million which actually amounts to 1.67 percent of 30 million and this number has been subtracted to arrive at 15 percent so basically if this if this number was not subtracted and actually he had done a performance of 16.67 percent just from a fund performance perspective like suppose if we didn't have these expenses or suppose he was blackrock or vanguard or fidelity then 500,000 for these guys because the maid will be paid so much any which way like that's like a fixed cost think about it right but for 500,000 over 9 trillion with blackrock 
that's a very small amount which gets subtracted right but for this guy this amounts to 1.67 percent of the fund so that's what this mr lordman is having second thoughts as to look i'm penalizing this guy much uh, this guy on the face of it yes 15 percent is the return but actually his managerial performance is quite good and there is 1.67 percent that is getting subtracted so his returns if you add back the fixed expenses is 16.67 percent that's a very good adjustment i mean this now <clears throat> otherwise you look at uh, similar kind of a strategy with blackrock and whatnot they are showing 15.5 percent let's say right uh, but this guy is actually done 16.67 not 15 so something to keep in mind good example what is the net return that investors in rhine valley earned during the five year period right so the net return when they use the word this is um, <clears throat> the net return so which is after expenses hmm? so actually the uh, net return is what the mutual fund is reporting so let's say for the first year it was 15 percent then he lost money i don't remember the number and total of all that that hpr whatever we calculated is 42.35 that is net of expenses all these expenses have already been taken out of it so that number that they are reporting is the net return hmm. then they are talking about <clears throat> What is the after tax net return? So there is gross return from that, take out the expenses, you get to net return. From the net return, take out the taxes, right? Now, suppose if you withdraw money and uh, what are the for the first year, right? So the first year, this guy earned 15%. And now, suppose I withdraw the money. Now, withdraw the money, that means this guy has to sell all the investments. Now the taxes are going to be paid by me, or let's say they are paying on my behalf, whatever. Um, so suppose the taxes are twenty percent, right? So from fifteen percent, take out twenty percent. So net net, I only get eighty percent of fifteen percent, right? Fifteen percent minus twenty percent of fifteen percent is taken out, and so the after-tax net return would be and so the net return itself is gross minus the expenses of which is 15 percent from this take out 20 percent and what i'm left with is 12 percent what is the after tax real return perfect right real return essentially means you will have to take back out <clears throat> uh, from your after tax net return you have to back out your uh inflation okay uh, <clears throat> and um, i don't know where they have uh, they must have given the uh, inflation so they are talking about fifth year so let's go back actually see where they've given tax and inflation numbers they must have Annual returns. No, somehow they've just assumed. Okay, they've assumed a tax. At least I don't see it. Yeah, they've assumed an inflation of two percent, and they've assumed a tax rate of twenty percent. That's okay. I mean, as long as our question gets answered in the exam and all, they will give you. Don't worry. <coughs> So they would have earned, um, so in the fifth year, suppose they're earning 3%, right? Uh, so for the, from the 3%, take out the taxes, right? So then that becomes after tax net return. So 3% minus 20% of 3%, that becomes 2.4%. Now, this 2.4% is your after tax net return. This will, you can also call it as the nominal return. The nominal return is made up of inflation and the real return, right? So just so that you're not confused, right? First, there is gross, then there is net, then there is after tax, 
right? And this return itself, you can call it as nominal return. So you or you can call it after tax net return. And and then you back you take out inflation from it. You will say I have after tax net real return. Hmm. And how are these things linked? If you watch the class lectures, you will see we did this one plus nominal is equal to one plus real times one plus inflation. So right. So my nominal return <coughs> this right the gross and the net was three percent then there was 20 percent tax so this one number was 2.4 so this number is 1.024 and i actually want to calculate the real return right and the inflation given is 1.02 so solve for this equation and divide 1.024 by 1.02 subtract one this is what they're doing and so your real return is a real increase in purchasing power parity the fifth year is 0.39 percent then you have the leverage return and uh, <clears throat> there was that uh, formula that we did in the class and uh, here they are uh, <clears throat> they they are giving you geometric returns basically when they say geometric return they are basically annualized right so equities over a certain time period have generated eight percent corporate bonds six and a half percent treasury bills two and a half percent and inflation during that time period has been 2.1 percent right so what they are asking for us to calculate is real rate of return for equities because remember this is still nominal right and nominal is made up of real plus the inflation so this 1.08 needs to be divided by 1.021, just like what we did in the previous calculation. And then you need to subtract 1. 1.08, which is the 1 plus nominal, right? Divided by 1 plus inflation, uh, minus 1, should we view the real rate of return. The real return for corporate bonds is closest to, right? So corporate bonds is the same thing, 1.065 divided by 1.021. The whole thing, subtract one. The risk premium for equities is closest to. Now, now risk premium <coughs> is considered from the perspective of treasuries, right? So treasuries have returned 2.5%. This is nominal return, right? Nominal risk-free return. This is nominal risky return of equities, right? And the, the, the way this works is the nominal risky return is going to be equal to, or one plus the nominal risky return is equal to one plus the risk free times one plus the risk premium. So, same like that, you will do, um, you know, because. So you can say one plus nominal risky is equal to one plus nominal risk free <coughs> times one plus the risk premium. So because whatever the treasuries have done, you should have done a little bit more than the treasuries because you already had a risk premium built into it. So here we have 1.08 equal to what did treasuries do? 1.025. times one plus the risk premium. So you already have everything. Divide 1.08 with 1.025, then subtract one, you should get one plus the risk premium. The risk premium for corporate bonds is closest to same thing. One plus the returns of the corporate bonds, which is the nominal risky returns, divided by one plus the risk free returns minus one, 3.9%. And that completes the problem solving for rates and return, the first chapter in quant. Good luck. Keep solving and keep learning. All right. Bye bye.